Cool. All right. Very good. Hey, everybody. It's uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for thank you for having me. Uh, this is a big honor uh, to come and speak to you. Um, so uh, we're talking today about profiling and benchmarking with an eye towards uh, making your slow code a little bit faster. Um, so feel free to follow me on social media or GitHub. I'm not like super active on those platforms, uh, but I'm there. Um, also, check out this. I don't know if you can see it. This awesome uh, palm tree R shirt that my wife just made me. <laughs> about 10 minutes ago for this talk it's a uh, it, it's just it's just a southern california theme so that's what, that's what we're going with um let me okay there we go so a little bit about me before we get started so uh like amy said i'm uh, coming to you from the chicago area the western suburbs uh this is i found this picture in my parents basement uh so i i just had to throw it in here this is uh this is my family in, in the mid 1980s uh times were good <laughs> and um this is this is my family today uh, as, as of last year. Um, so a few changes have happened. And uh, of course, uh, that very handsome baby, that, that one is me. Uh, so, um, he, so I mentioned I'm not, I'm not super active on GitHub right now. I've got a bunch of side projects and, and unfortunately they're uh, not things that I can, I can commit to GitHub, but uh, there they are. <laughs> Those are my kids. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I, I do have a California connection. I got my master's in biostatistics in 2014 from UC Davis. Um, so uh, right after that, I ended up moving to Illinois. Uh, I had actually married a Californian, a Southern Californian. She uh, grew up in Simi Valley. I was really hoping that would be my ticket to staying in California forever, but it didn't work out. So, so here I am. Um, that's me. And I, so I've, I, I've been using R since about 2013, uh, where I learned it uh, at, at Davis. but. Um, Enough about me, let's talk about why we're here. So um, I don't know about you, but I roll my eyes whenever someone tells me that R is a slow language. Maybe you've heard that uh, oftentimes among people who don't actually use R that often, but it's a common stereotype. Uh, but at the same time, you know, R code can be slow if we aren't careful. So, um, and, and, you know, and, and that's because in R we're free to achieve our objectives in many different ways uh, and that freedom comes at a cost, and it's sort of up to us to understand the computational intensity of our methods. So we have to have this computational awareness. And if you've been around R for even a short while, you may have heard this quotation from John Chambers um, a long time ago. He said, to understand computations in R, two slogans are helpful. Everything that exists is an object, and everything that happens is a function call. So why do we care about this? Well, objects are things that use memory and functions are things that use processing power, both of which affect the performance of our code. So when we talk about writing more efficient code, we generally start by addressing the second slogan uh, first, and that means writing better functions. So writing functions that are fast, uh, of course, memory is an issue too, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, all right, so you know it's safe to assume that we're talking about code being slow, probably Hadley can save us. Uh, so so uh, he, he, of course, wrote this book um, called Advanced R. He says, before you can make your code faster, you need to figure out what's making it slow. Um, this sounds easy, but it's not. Even experienced programmers have a hard time identifying bottlenecks in their code. Okay, so the, the answer is not actually always that clear, and it's not always something that a machine is gonna be able to figure out for us. The machines can help, uh, and, and we do have tools that we can use. Uh, and also, it's it's okay for the, for the process of understanding our code and and figuring out uh, you know where it's slow to feel challenging and confusing at times. You know, R is such a high level language, and there's a lot going on behind the scenes, and not much of that is really easy to understand. I know I don't understand a lot of it, um, even though I've been working with R for a long time. Uh, but again, we have tools to help us. Uh, let's just pause and admire the bow tie real quick because that's a good look. <laughs> um, all right, so how do we actually see the computational cost of our code? And that is profiling. Profiling is the primary tool for understanding the performance of our code. We generate a profile of a function to understand what is going on under the hood in minute detail. Okay, uh, so the question is what is a profile? So we'll define a profile as R's estimate of the resources consumed during the execution of code. 
The build a profile, R inspects the call stack many times per second, and logs the current function and memory allocation that it sees each time it inspects that call stack. Okay, so to understand a profile, we need a better picture of what the call stack is. Let's take a look at that. All right, so a call stack is a record of all of the functions that, an, that another function called to get its job done. I'm gonna kind of oversimplify things a little bit here, but um, I'll give you an example to kind of help us understand how profiling works. So let's just say that we're looking to buy a house. Um, mortgage rates are at an all-time low, right? So let's just pretend. Um, so we could describe the steps of touring a house with various function calls. So for example, when we tour the house, we might tour both the first floor and the second floor. Hey, when we tour the first floor, we might survey the kitchen and then check the garage, admire the backyard. Having done that, we move on to the second floor where we view the bathrooms and inspect, uh, yeah, sorry, view the bedrooms and inspect the bathroom. Okay, so now let's think about how we might visualize this process. You can think of the house tour as a nested set of activities that, and, and then from there we can build a visual representation out of these individual blocks. So let's lay out the overall tour as one big block that encompasses all of the activities. Okay, so similarly, let's lay out the tour of the first floor as one part of the overall house tour, and then going a step further, stack each step of the first floor tour on top of that block. Okay, so we're basically building a schematic of the tour from these blocks. Now, in the same way, we can lay out the rest of our visit by stacking blocks for the upstairs tour and further dividing that into its individual components. We've now visualize the whole tour as a hierarchy of activities. In real code, it's important to keep in mind that functions are constantly calling other functions, and that kind of creates this, this stack of function calls that are kind of nested like this. Now, here this, the call stack forms a nice rectangle in the example I've given, but bear in mind that more convoluted or nested call stacks might have different shapes, and you might actually see peaks and valleys depending on the depth of certain function calls. We'll see that in a second. Okay, but the overall idea is that in profiling, R is sort of using its power to peer into this call stack and figure out just how long each step is taking and how much memory is being used up. Feels a little bit like dark magic. So. Sauron, Sauron is peeking into our, our call stack here. So how are we actually gonna get a profile? Um, the R community gives us a few options, uh, even some that ship with R, like the utils package, uh, has some basic uh, profiling functionality. Um, Prof tools is a good option from Luke Tierney. He's been around R for a long time. Uh, so he knows what he's doing. It's got a lot of nice visualization features as well. Uh, I mentioned nested call stacks. Uh, and if you look at the um, documentation for, um, uh, for prof tools, you can see this is one example here where you kind of have this like, um, this like very deeply nested uh, kind of call stack here. And this is just kind of one cool example that he provides in his documentation. Um, I'm going to focus here on ProfViz for its simplicity, but also for its integration with RStudio, which makes it really nice. It's maintained by Winston Chang. Um, so let's take a closer look at the ProfViz package. Um, let's look at the main function, which is conveniently called ProfViz. Uh, and it's got a bunch of arguments, but the most important one is the expression argument, which is the code you want to profile. And that's usually a function that you yourself have written. The other main argument is the time interval in seconds at which you want to sample the call stack. And that's usually a pretty small number. And then there's some other stuff, including output options, um, memory management, and other stuff that you should take a look at on your own time. OK, so to use this function, you would give the expression argument a function that you wrote. So you just have this function that's running too long, uh, and then a sampling interval. So the default for the sampling interval is uh, 1 one hundredth of a second, and that works pretty well. Uh, so normally you wouldn't have to change this. But this, just, this just means every 1 one hundredth of a second, R is examining your call stack and seeing where you are, um, which function is being executed, how much memory is being used. Okay, so this is all it really takes to run this function. Now we're going to look at how this thing actually works in practice. 
Okay, so live demo time. Uh, brace yourselves. Anything could happen. <laughs> I'm going to flip over to my R Studio here and just quickly check can everybody still see this? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, here I have. I, I, I've written the same house tour functions that we saw oh, can't earlier. See, we can't see your R Studio. Sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, let me stop sharing them and reshare. Yeah, stop and sharing and then reshare. Yep, I, I share the wrong thing. So. I, I only know this because I make this every other make that mistake yes. the other day. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> so, so that meant that meant you couldn't see the. Uh, sorry, this this was the visual of pro, of the Prof Tools package I was trying to show earlier um, with the peaks and valleys. So, so this is like a. A graph that might come out of uh, Luke Journey's prop tools package. Sorry, you couldn't see that. Okay. So anyway, Adam. Yes. Adam Marina yes. has a question in chat. Oh sure. Yeah. What is it? She wants to see the expressions again. Show the slide with the oh. argument definitions again. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yep. Uh huh. Looking at chat. You sh somebody should be. Thank you. Yeah. Well, so yeah. So let's look at the. So so this is just like a high level view of of, of what the arguments are for prop is. So you have an expression, which is your code to profile. And usually you're just passing it a, a function. And I'll show you how that works in a second. And then you have uh, the time interval. And then you have a bunch of other stuff. And it, I would totally encourage you to go to the Profis documentation and see what, what that other stuff is that helps you manage like what kind of output you get, how you handle the memory uh, management, things like that. It, it, there's a ton of options there. So go check that out. The, the time interval has a default, so you don't have to change this. I think the default there, 0.01, is is pretty is pretty reasonable. So you can usually keep that for the most part. Um, but otherwise, you're just passing a function to that expr argument. Um, so let me just show you how it works, because uh, because it'll all become clear if it's still confusing. Okay. Um, so so what I've done here is I I've, I've written out this house tour. Right, so we have the, the, the tour first floor, the tour upstairs, and again, the tour first floor consists of three parts. You're looking at the kitchen, the garage, and the backyard. And then when you go upstairs, you're viewing the bedrooms and the bathroom. So it's just kind of a nested set of, of function calls. Most of these things are taking one second. I've written them to just, uh, to, to just create a system pause of, sorry, one-tenth of a second. And except for inspecting the bathroom, where I've written that to take a system pause of three tenths of a second. Maybe you're like really into plumbing and you just want to make sure everything's good. So you're spending a lot of time scoping out the bathroom. It's very important. <laughs> okay. Um, th so these functions, as you can see, they're, they're not computing anything or returning any objects. It's just for illustrative purposes so that when I show you how ProfViz works, you get a good sense of what's going on. Okay. I'm going to flip over to a different script now that's just going to run this tour. So let's just focus on this top block here and I'm actually going to blow this up a little bit just to make it a little easier to read. All right, so I'm going to source my house touring code. Okay, so all those functions are loaded up. Now I'm going to do is called profis and I'm just going to pass it the top level function, tour house. That's the whole thing. And that's all I'm going to do. And it's going to run a profile and now some magic happened. Okay, the, the result here is this is, is a nice summary of the action in a new R Studio pane. And actually what's cool about this is you can pop this out. You can either just pop this out as its own like R Studio window, or you can open it in a browser. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna open this in the browser and I'm gonna blow this up so you can all see it. Okay. So right away you'll notice a couple things. You've got kind of two panes in this viewer. Uh, at the top, you've got all the code that I sourced. So um, you know, these are all the functions that I wrote, uh, and, and all these functions ran, and that's what is being represented here. Uh, and on the right now, you'll see a memory column and a time column, and these provide a graphical view of memory usage and time spent in different parts of the script. The script didn't generate any objects, so no memory was consumed. So this is empty right now. We'll fill that later. <laughs> uh, but, but on the right, you, you do see the function did take time, and that's what, the, what is being shown here on the right. Okay. So on the bottom pane, we now have a call stack that looks very similar to the one we drew earlier. This thing down here, uh, right? It was that rectangular call stack I showed you earlier in the slides. Um, so when building the profile, R inspected my call stack and built this view based on the structure and the timing of our functions. This representation down here is called a flame graph because of the flame-like shape 
it sometimes takes when displaying complicated call stacks. So remember this, uh, this view here uh, from prop tools. This is also called a flame graph because it looks kind of like tongues of fire shooting up. Um, so uh, what you should notice here is, is in the flame graph now on the x-axis, we have the total runtime of the function uh, in milliseconds. So this whole thing took about 700 milliseconds. Okay. And, and in fact, the horizontal distance of each piece of this graph indicates how long that section took. So recall most of our functions were designed to take about 100 milliseconds. So that would be here. This, in this case, it clocked it at, at 90. Uh, but of course, inspecting the bathroom was, was meant to take longer. Uh, looks like it's just froze up on me. Okay, anyways, inspecting the bathroom took, took a little longer, so 300 milliseconds. Um, and as I, move, as I move my mouse over various sections of these functions, uh, of course, this is a live demo, things are breaking. Okay, as I'm moving my mouse around, you can see that it's highlighting different parts of my, of, 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 of my top pane, and so it's, it's, it's linking the top pane to the bottom pane, so you can kind of get a, a clearer view of, of where each function call was happening and how long these things took. So one more nice feature that I want to point out in this view, and that's the data tab. So here we are. We are looking at the flame graph tab up top. It's also a data tab. Okay, so I'm going to click this, and it provides an expandable hierarchical view of the call stack. So uh, the top level function we called was to her house. It took about 700 milliseconds. But I can expand that, and I, would, I can look at the upstairs tour and the, and the first floor tour. So upstairs took about 400 milliseconds overall. Uh, and I can expand that further and break it down and look at the individual pieces. Okay, uh, so this is a really nice way. You know, so sometimes your functions are super complicated and this is hard to read, but a lot of times this is actually a really nice way to view your memory and time usage. And so this is a pretty simple and, and contrived example. I do want to show you what this might look like in a real world scenario where you write a loop that you don't really need. Um, so let me go back to my code and Let's go to, all right, this, this is a function I wrote that takes, uh, takes a square root. The function is called take square root. So uh, it takes a square root of a vector. The way I've chosen to do this is intentionally bad. Um, it it, it uh, takes the, the, the square root of the first element of the input okay, and assigns it to x. And then it iterates over all the other elements of the input and grows this vector. So if, you, if you've been coding in R for even a brief amount of time, you probably learned this is not the right way to do this. Uh, but we're going to try it just to see what happens. Um, so let's look at this. Uh, you know, let's see what happens from a profiling standpoint when we grow a vector in an inefficient way. What I'm going to do is I'm going to source that code. So now I have that square root function. And I'm going to take the square root of this big, long vector and cross your fingers that this runs it takes a little it takes a little bit <laughs> so i just want to make sure i capture all the weirdness that goes on okay something's happening there it is all right i'm going to pop this out and blow it up so you can see it all right so let's do that all right so okay Right away, there are a couple signs here that we might have a problem. So the first is at the top pane, uh, we see not just a long runtime, but we also see a lot uh, happening with the memory. There's actually a fair amount of memory allocation on the right and deallocation on the left. Okay, and this tells us that R spent a lot of effort creating objects and then cleaning them up, which is pretty inefficient. Okay, and you can also see the flame graph down here is a huge mess. Uh, it's really hard to read. It's hard to tell what's going on. Uh, you can actually zoom in on these things, which is really cool. It's a nice, like, interactive interface. Um, so I'm just kind of like uh, scroll, using a scroll wheel and zooming in, um, enlarging certain sections. Uh, and what, what you can see is there's a lot of calls to GC, which stands for garbage collection. And too many garbage collection steps tells you that R is working really hard to allocate blocks of memory and then get rid of them when it doesn't need them anymore. So R is actually copying our vector every time it's adding a new element. So it's, it's, it's using way more memory than it needs to to actually take the square root. Uh, you probably could have guessed that by looking at the way the function is written. Uh, 
so of course you'd be much better off using R's vectorization to accomplish the same thing this function was doing. Uh, but this is an interesting example of, of what a bad, a bad function call might look like. You can look at the data view here too, um, and you can kind of see where all the problems were. So the you know the there's there's memory management and there's time consumed in this in this core block here, uh, but most of the problem here is that you know, it's vector driven stuff. Okay. So that's not too surprising, I hope. Um, let me get rid of that. And I am going to flip back to our presentation. And how are we doing on time? I think we're okay. All right, so I want to talk about a few ways things could go wrong uh, and how you might actually speed your code up. And I'm not necessarily suggesting that you would find yourself doing some of these things because some of these are pretty contrived examples. Uh, but just to illustrate where some of the problems are lurking that maybe you're not thinking about when you're writing some of your code. So um, extraneous for loops uh, kind of goes hand in hand with, with what we just saw. Um, you know, in, so, in some languages, the way you might total up a vector is by looping over the uh, the elements of that vector and just uh, you know, initializing some kind of total variable to zero and then just continuing to sum up your total plus the newest input and reassign, you know, overwriting your old, your old total object there. And that's what might be how you would take a sum, for example. Of course, we know that's you know, not the best way to do it. In R, thank goodness, we just have this sum function. Uh, so you just take your input, you just throw it into sum, and then what's happening is, of course, we have these built-in vectorized functions that call C code under the hood and run their loops super fast. So that's what's happening here. There's a ton of really interesting loops. Um, and if you go digging around the R documentation, you can find some of these cool ones. Uh, you know, so like not, not only is there is there sum, which is returning a single number, but you have cum sum, which is the cumulative sum. Uh, as you iterate over the vector, you, you generate a cumulative sum. There's prod, which is a, which is a product, cum prod. It's the same thing as cum sum, but iterates and takes the product each time. And then there's all kinds of really interesting loops that, you, that, that are built in and are way faster than anything that you can accomplish in a for loop. So, um, you know, for example, call means is going to take the means of all your columns, row means the, the means of all your rows. Cool stuff like that. All right, let's go to the next level. Speed bumps 201. Um, memory not allocated. Okay, so we actually dug into this in our live demo with the square root function. So sometimes, uh, you know, if you, if you initialize the value of an output to just a single value, and then you iterate over a vector and you grow your vector, uh, that's a problem for memory allocation. Right. Um, there are a whole way, a whole series of ways you can do this better. You can either pre-allocate your vector before entering the for loop, that's totally valid. You can use uh, members of the apply family, which pre-allocate memory, so R doesn't repeatedly make new copies of the vector. Um, and there's a whole host of apply family functions. Uh, they're running out of letters. I don't even know what all these things do, but go ahead, go and check them out. They might be applicable to your situation. This v apply function uh, is actually pretty slick. I learned about this in a workshop um, from Hadley Wickham himself. <laughs> uh, so this is kind of cool. If you know that the output of your function is, for example, a numeric value. You can actually specify what type of output R should expect. And that does two really cool things for you. If, if you loop over some input and apply some function, and the output doesn't match what you expect, it throws a really helpful error, and you'll be able to track down where that problem happens way more easily. The other thing it does is because it's because you are pre-specifying what, what R should expect, R doesn't have to take the extra step of interpreting your output every time and checking the output against the vector you've already created to see if the output vector should remain the same class. And so you're actually getting a speed boost by specifying that class up front. So kind of a cool trick. Um, um, Adam? Yeah, someone, talk to me. Uh, someone actually had a question in the chat for tool. Sure. Uh, why is the output down in two steps? Uh, let me see. 
Can you see the chat? Well, let me see. Um, where is the chat? Oh, there it is. I feel like an old person. Grandma, where is the chat? Oh. The question is, why are you using output yeah, and then right, output right. I? Oh, um, right. Yeah, this was right. So this was to show uh, an example of what you wouldn't want to do. So, so output. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm, I've, I've got some kind of input vector and I'm just calling a function on it and saying, uh, call the function on the first element of the vector. And that's my, that's my output. And now I've got this single valued output. And now I'm going to grow the rest of my output vector one element at a time by, by forcing this kind of, you know, this, this subset to say like, okay, now I want the second element of my output to be the application of some function on the second element of my input. And I'm just kind of growing the vector one, one element at a time. I don't know if that helps. Oh. And also, uh, your your microphone kind of, I think it's a little bit unclear when you touch the computer. Oh, sorry. Hands <laughs> off. <laughs> okay. Maybe yeah, because your, uh, your microphone, the, the wire is shaking, uh, maybe touch the computer sometimes. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I'll, uh, I'll try to be more gentle on it. I get so excited. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, Shall I move on? Uh, yes, please. Okay, okay sweet. Um, so this, this one is kind of interesting. Uh, too much subsetting. Um, it's a little bit sneaky. So maybe, uh, you know, just hypothetically, you read in a data frame and uh, it just happens that for whatever reason, you've got a whole bunch of like columns that were read in as characters and you want to convert them all to integers, something like that. Perhaps you've, you've iterated over columns and uh, forced a new type on those columns. This is one way to do it. So you can say, um, you know, for my column, in each of my column names, I, I'm going to overwrite that column by forcing a new type of that column. This is, this is a valid way to replace columns with uh, the same data, but a new, a new class, right? So maybe you don't want them to be uh, numerics, you want them to be integers, for example, or whatever it is. And this is actually kind of cool. What you can do is use this empty bracket subsetting trick. And you can actually loop, you can still loop. Uh, let's use an L apply in this case. You can, you can do an L apply over your data frame and then do your type coercion. But now you're storing it here back to the original data frame using this empty bracket subsetting. And that just means, um, the, the empty brackets mean preserve the class when you return the output. So normally, if you're calling this L apply, you're getting a list back. That's what the L stands for. Uh, so normally you would get back a list of each column now as an integer, but it's in list format. But this empty square bracket subsetting is actually forcing it to retain the class. Um, so this is like, this is kind of like a weird esoteric trick, but if you ever do have to do something like this, this actually creates a huge uh, food group. Um, but square bracket subsetting can also be used for other purposes um, in, in replacement. So to selectively replace values in a vector, for example, you might use different subsetting conditions if you wanted to replace values that were NA or that were infinite um, or that were equal to some value or not equal to some value. Right. You don't have to write a loop and check each individual value of that vector and then replace it if, you know, if some condition is true in that one specific value. You just use square bracket assignment and you subset the vector according to some condition and then just overwrite all of the values that, that have that condition with some new value. Okay, so this is, this is pretty slick. You don't have to do a for loop for this. You can just do square bracket subsetting. I remember I was, I started my analytics life in economics and um, we, we were using Stata and Stata stores missing values as minus infinity. And that just drove us crazy. <laughs> because 
if you wanted if you wanted to like take all the values that were less than something uh, you would get not only all the values you know less than 10 but also all of the missing values because those were minus infinity which were also less than 10 nuts so anyway if you had something crazy like that you, you could replace all, all the values that had some kind of infinite value with something else okay um this is one of my favorites speed bumps 401 sneaky functions um sometimes you can feel like you're doing all the right things but you still end up with slow code uh, and, and this just kind of goes to show that life isn't fair. <laughs> but um, everything, that, everything, everything that happens in R is a function call. Even things you don't expect to be function calls are function calls. So let me show you an example here. So here in this, in this top block here, we're, we're looping over some vector y. And we're calling a function from a package with this canonical package name, double colon function kind of syntax. Okay. And, and actually what happens is that that is not the optimal way to do that from a speed perspective. The best way to do that would be to, to, to load the package first and not call the namespace directly with the two colons because everything that happens in R is a function call, even those two colons, that's also a function call. A lot of sneaky functions, not all of these things take a lot of time uh, to execute. So that's not always a huge deal. But if you are running code over and over and over again and using a lot of these functions like dollar sign or you know some kind of like um, assignment step where you're replacing something in square brackets, that it's a function call and it takes time to execute. It takes time for for R to interpret that. So just be aware of these things. Um, if we have time later, because I'm I'm running out of time, I will actually show you how this double colon can be a problem. If you call it too many times, because it does, it does actually end up taking a lot of time. It's kind of surprising. Okay, I gotta move on. But questions you should ask yourself: Do you even need to optimize? So, if you've run a profile and broken a function down, uh, you know that's the time to stop and decide whether there's any point in making it faster, right? So, there's a lot of questions here on the left, but basically the idea is if you know if if the function is being called once and uh you know maybe you run the process once a month or something and you think you can shave off like 30 seconds or something from the function call you know out of a whole period of like a two-hour process it doesn't really need to be optimized at, at that point um that being said now if you know if you have a very slow function you're calling over and over and over again that's when you need to start thinking about optimization optimization and and and, and, and speeding up your code it takes time it's it's an investment you just have to decide if it's worth it. Okay, uh, profiling has a few limitations. Uh, a profile is not deterministic, uh, which means that um, every time you run it, you might get different results, slightly different results. They'll be more or less similar, but you can't expect to get identical results every time just because you know, R is checking in at, at a very frequent intervals. And um, because of the way processors work, it just you just might be a, in a slightly different place each time R is checking. Okay. If you write with a lot of anonymous functions, you know, you can write a lot of anonymous functions inside the S apply or L apply or any of the apply families. Uh, those can't be distinguished from one another. So if you have a bunch of those kind of all squished together in your code, it might be hard to tell what's going on. Um, lazy evaluation might make the call stack hard to interpret. So you think a, a function is being called in one part of your script. Oh no, did he freeze? I think he froze. Oh no. Well, now don't you know how they work? Let me see. Yeah, Amy? Uh, yeah, you froze. Oh, I froze. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, you're back. Am now. I back? Yeah. Okay, cool. I think well, you lost you right, right, right at lazy evaluation. Okay. Yeah, lazy evaluation just uh, basically means, you know, R is only going to execute code when it decides it needs to. So if you are, if you expect a function to be executed in one part of the overall process, but it actually doesn't get executed until much later because it isn't called until it's needed, uh, that might be confusing. Um, and then uh, the usual profiling tools will not help you with compiled code like C++ uh, code. So the um, 
I don't actually know how to profile those. That's outside my expertise, so I'm not even going to comment any further, but <laughs> profiling won't help you with that. All right, so uh, we've, let's say that we've profiled a function and we've decided that we found a big source of our problem and we want to know now how to make it better. So profiling helped us find bottlenecks in a sequence of steps of our function. Benchmarking is going to help us compare alternative approaches to one of those individual steps. If we found our bottleneck and we want to just target that one specific piece of code and find something that's better, that's where benchmarking comes in. Okay, so it's, it, it's called benchmarking. It might be called micro benchmarking in some contexts. It's kind of the same thing. Uh, but basically, uh, a micro benchmark or a benchmark, it's a performance comparison of different functions that accomplish the same thing. Benchmarks provide the timing of small, specific, and relatively short pieces of code. If you hear micro benchmark, it sounds fancy. It's, it's, just a, it's just a way to say you're timing your functions. That's all it is. All right, let's take a quick look at uh, the benchmarking packages. Uh, these are all in CRAN. Uh, you've got base, kind of, if you want to make use of system.time, but that's not a super accurate way to do it. So there are these other options. You've got R benchmark, micro benchmark, TikTok, which is not the app, but something else. <laughs> this is a benchmarking package. Uh, and then there's um, a package called Bench. There's tons of choices here. Um, look into all these, they're all good. So, you know, uh, in your spare time, go out and decide what meets your needs. I'm gonna focus on Bench uh, because it's pretty easy to use. It has a nice, um, nice outputs. Uh, so here is what the Bench package looks like. The central function in the Bench package is this function called mark because it's cutesy because you get to say bench mark when you do it, when you write it this way. So um, the first argument here is the three dots. So here you would pass comma separated expressions to benchmark. I'll show you what I mean in a second. Um, there's also a min time argument, and this is the minimum number of seconds to run each expression. So benchmark is actually running your expressions over and over and over and over again uh, to get a a good estimate of the average time it takes to run those expressions. Okay, there's a bunch of other stuff in there too, like iteration counts, memory management, and uh, please feel free to look at those in your spare time. Um, so this is what I mean by passing comma separated functions for the dots. So, so instead of dots, you would just put as many functions as you want to benchmark together separated by commas. Okay. Uh, the, the, the default value for the minimum runtime is half a second. That runs fine for most cases. If you've got a super long running function, you can change this. You can make it longer if you want to. Okay. So yeah, again, add as many functions as you require. Um, let's, let's continue with our example from earlier when we took a square root. If you recall, we took a square root using a really poor approach. All right, so let's say we did, we did some research. We learned that we can use vectorization to take the square root but now we want to know which approach is going to be fastest. So we could just pass in our different approaches to this mark function. Uh, and again, it's important that these functions are accomplishing the same task so that we know our results are directly comparable to one another. So here, you know, just taking the square root of all the values from one to a thousand in two different ways. All right, I know that we're real short on time. So I'm going to do a quick demo. Um, and then I will encourage you to check out more of this kind of Let's just look here. I have a, a script. I've got this input, which is just the vector one to a thousand. And I'm going to use my benchmark function. I am going to pass the input to the square root function. I'm going to pass the input to the caret function and just raise my input to the power one half. I'm going to use this fancy version just for fun where I exponentiate and then do this fancy stuff, which is again the same way to take the square root. And then I'm just, just for fun, I'm gonna use my old take square root function, which we know to be bad, uh, just to add a little drama. Okay. And I'm actually gonna save the output to this object that I call BM. It's gonna be a tibble, and I'll show you what it looks like. So let's run this. Okay, it just takes a quick second to run. And let me just give you a real quick show you what the output of this function is. Uh, eh, you know, I have to actually shrink this down a little bit. Okay, I'm gonna try this again. Show you what this looks like. All right, so it's a table. It's got a bunch of columns. 
Uh, and then what it's doing is on the left, it's showing you all the expressions that we ran. See, okay, so that's here on the left. And then it gives you a median time. It runs these functions a bunch of times, and then it will compute for you the median time spend on each function. Uh, and then it will tell you, you know, if, it, if it's nanoseconds or microseconds or, or milliseconds, whatever it is. Here we have microseconds. Okay, so what we can see here is the median time, the best function to use is SQRT, square root. That's the fastest time based on our median. Um, this in second place, surprisingly, is this fancy version. Uh, our intentionally bad function is clearly bad. It has the longest runtime. There's a whole bunch of columns in this object. I want you to go and uh, look at the documentation when you have time. Um, I'll just show you, right? There's like the number of iterations per second you've accomplished, the number of garbage collections per second it, it did, things like that. It's all really great information for you to help you figure out what's going on. You can also make a plot uh, by default. You can use the, the standard plotting method to, to plot this benchmark object. And by default, it does this bee swarm plot, uh, where it kind of shows you just the distribution of all the runs that it executed for each function. And it gives you a really nice idea of, of how fast or slow each function is. Beware that the x-axis here is on a log scale, too. So um, you've also got other plotting options. I won't show you all of them, but there's different kinds of types you can throw in here, too. So uh, all good stuff. OK. Um, I took a lot of this information from Hadley's Advanced R book, so please go check it out. Uh, he, here's the URL, uh, chapter 23 and 24 are the places to start, and you'll get some really good tips, uh, some other cool uh, speed up tricks uh, that, you, that you can learn there. But until then, that was my talk, and um, please feel free to reach out to me uh, on social media if you have any questions or thoughts, and uh, happy to chat. Thank you so much for for being here and for your time.